thank you for joining us today. So it's my pleasure to introduce Stefan Brasselid coming to us from near Malmo in Sweden this evening. So, um, Stefan is the scientific lead for the society and so today is going to be talking about the endocannabinoid system. This is the companion webinar to a new paper that he's written and we'll be sharing that with you along with the recording over the next couple of days. So um, throughout the um, presentation, if you have any questions, please do use the Q&A function. Uh, we'll come to the questions at the end of the um, presentation. So I'll hand over to Stefan. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kate. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, today to give you a talk that focuses strictly on the physiology of the endocannabinoid system, or rather its expanded version, the endocannabinoidome. As Kate explained, the presentation is largely based on a scientific review that will be launched momentarily. It focuses on the physiology of the ECBOM, as well as introduces how cannabis is able to leverage its effects through the modulation of said system. It's an extensive summary that I hope and think will provide a useful resource when acquiring new knowledge about medical cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. So the lecture today will cover these key areas. We're starting off with a short introductory discussion on why ECS education is important in medicine. This will be followed by an introduction to the ECS and its expanded counterpart, the ECBOM. We will spend most of the time today talking about ECBOM biology and ECBOM imbalances in modern chronic diseases, specifically in metabolic disorders and neurodegenerative diseases in which impaired metabolism is a common feature. More specifically, I will discuss ECBOM dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease, and we will spend the final minutes of the lecture with a brief discussion on the ECBOM and how it fits into the concept of precision medicine. So this slide shows important discoveries in human physiology and how they were added to the Guyton and Hall textbook of medical physiology. The timeline goes from the 5th edition in 1976 to the 14th edition in 2020, highlighting many key discoveries. What quickly becomes clear when looks, looking at the chart is that no other significant discovery in human physiology has taken as long as the endocannabinoid system to be implemented in medical textbooks. Discovered in the early 1990s, and despite its crucial role in keeping our bodies balanced, the ECS is yet to enter medical education and textbooks in physiology. And this is mainly because of its link to cannabis, which has caused misunderstandings and a lack of thorough teaching. In science and medicine, semantics is crucial. Think about how we have named other body systems. A good example is the parasympathetic nervous system. We don't refer it to it as the endomuscarinic system, even though we very much could have. Instead, we named it based on its main function, due, doing the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. Similarly, we should recognize the endocannabinoid system for its main role, which is keeping our bodies in balance. By learning more about the ECS and including it in medical training, we can create better, more personalized treatments for many conditions, as well as doctors with increased knowledge levels and medical skills. And this isn't just about medical cannabis. It's about understanding a key part of human physiology that can change how we practice medicine. So the endocannabinoid system, or ECS, is a complex network that plays a crucial role in regulating many of our body's functions. It includes the two key molecules, anandamide and 2-AG. These molecules interact with receptors called CB1 and CB2. CB1 receptors are primarily found in the brain and are involved in functions like mood, memory, and pain. CB2 receptors are mostly found in the immune system and help to regulate inflammation and immune responses. The ECS also includes the enzymes that helps produce and break down these molecules, ensuring that the system runs tightly and on demand. This slide provides an overview of the endocannabinoidome, or ECBOM, which is then the expanded network beyond the basic endocannabinoid system. At the top, we can see different types of molecules involved in the ECBOM. They include the N-acyl ethanolamines, NAEs, like PEA, OEA, DHEA, and AEA, anandamide. We have the fatty acid primary amides, such as ODA, oleamide, N-acylated amino acids, like N-arachidonoyl glycine. 
We also have the two monoacid glycerols, where 2-AG might be familiar to you, but it also includes 2-OG, 2-PG, 2-LG, and many others. We have N-acylated neurotransmitters, exemplified by NADA or N-arachidonyl dopamine. The next category is bioactive PUFA metabolites or polyunsaturated fatty acid metabolites, uh, such as resolving D2. Uh, the microbiome derived ECVR mediators is the final category. They include molecules like Keto-A and SDEA. To clarify, the first letter in most of the ECBO mediators often denote a particular fatty acid. So PEA is palmitoyl ethanolamine, OEA is oleoyl ethanolamine, and the A in N andamide and 2AG, of course, stands for arachidonyl. These molecules interact with various receptors and enzymes shown at the bottom of the slide. Key receptors include CB1, CB2, and others like GPR55. GPR-119 and trip v one Enzymes like COX, LOX, and SIP are added in addition to FAAH and MAGL and are involved in the oxidative metabolism of ECBO mediators, producing bioactive PUFA metabolites with altered biological properties. The ECBO covers a broader range of biological functions compared to the ECS. It includes additional roles in immune function, inflammation, energy balance, and importantly, the bidirectional relationship with our friendly gut microbiome. Now let's continue with the biology of the ECBOME. In this section, we'll explore many interactions and components that make up this expanded system. Let's start looking at the top of the chart. It details examples of food sources for precursors to ECBO mediators. The arrows indicate how certain dietary fats and oils serve as precursors for many of these ECBO mediators. For example, olive oil provides oleic acid and omega-9 fatty acid, which can be converted into molecules like OEA, 2OG, and ODA. Omega-3 rich foods like fish provide DHA, EPA, and DPA which are precursors for the other ECBO mediators and anti-inflammatory oxidative metabolites. Omega-6 rich foods uh, like certain vegetable oils and processed foods provide large amounts of linoleic acid and arachidonic acid, which are precursors for molecules like 2-AG and anandamide, as well as pro-inflammatory oxidative metabolites. These dietary sources are crucial because they supply the building blocks for the ECBO mediators influencing various biological functions, such as inflammation, pain modulation, and energy balance. As we tend to eat way too much omega-6 rich food, the true defining character of the modern Western diet, the health ramifications of a diet high in omega-6 and low in omega-3 have begun to unravel. Today, we're not going to be discussing macronutrient with regards to healthy eating, but a major point that we'll be making is that polyunsaturated omega-3 and 6 fatty acids are far more than sources of caloric energy. Shifting our focus to dietary fibers and their importance in our health. Dietary fibers are not just important for buttering up our intestines. They're also metabolized by our gut microbiome into short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids, such as acetate, propionate, and butyrate, play a significant role in interacting with the ECBOME. They help to regulate inflammation, energy balance, and even mood. And importantly, also levels of several ECBOME mediators, including 2AG and PEA. SDEA and Keto-A are omega-3 and omega-6 derived ECBOME mediators, but they are produced by our friendly gut bacteria in addition to ourselves as long as we have the proper tenants in our microbiome. Understanding how dietary fibers contribute to the production of short chain fatty acids and their interaction with the ECBOME can help us appreciate the broader impact of our diet on overall health and well-being. Now let's look into the pharmacology of anandamide, shown as AEA in the diagram. Its primary dietary sources are from vegetable oils with high omega-6 content. All omega-6 fatty acids can be converted into arachidonic acids by our bodies. This we will talk more about in detail in a short while. Anandamide is broken down by the enzyme fatty acid amide hydrolase, FAAH. 
It interacts with a number of receptors in addition to the ECS receptors CB1 and CB2, influencing a wide repertoire of physiological processes. Ananda B, it also activates the nuclear receptor PPR gamma, a transcription factor that plays an important role in inflammation, immunity, neuroprotection, and lipid metabolism. Now let's look at the pharmacology of anandamides congeners, the other N-acyl ethanolamines. These compounds, including PEA, OEA, LEA, and DHEA, are derived from dietary sources rich in omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, and saturated fatty acids. They interact with multiple receptors, including GPR55, GPR119, and TRYPV1, as well as CB2. And unlike an andamide, which activates PPAR gamma, these congeners primarily activate PPAR alpha. PPAR alpha plays a crucial role in glucose metabolism, inflammation, and overall metabolic regulation. Now let's explore the pharmacology of 2-arachidonoglycerol, 2-AG. As can be seen in the chart, 2-AG is derived from dietary sources rich in omega-6 fatty acids. It's primarily broken down by the enzyme monoacyl lipase, or MAGL. 2-AG interacts with several receptors, including CB1 and CB2, playing a significant role in modulating pain, inflammation, and neuroprotection. 2-AG is present in the brain in a thousand-fold increased concentrations compared to anandamide and is therefore believed to be the primary retrograde neurotransmitter in the brain, modulating presynaptic neurotransmitter release. Another distinguishing feature of 2-AG is that it is a full agonist at CB1 and CB2, and this is in contrast to anandamide and THC, for instance, which are both partial agonists. 2-AG also influences metabolic processes through its activation of PPAR alpha. Now looking at 2-AG's congeners, the other two monoacyl glycerols, including 2-oleoil glycerol, 2-OG, 2-palmitoil glycerol, 2-PG, and 2-linoil glycerol, 2-LG. Similarly to the N-acyl ethanolamines, these compounds are derived from dietary sources rich in omega-3, 6, 9, or fatty acids, depending on which congener we're talking about. Like 2-AG, they're broken down by the enzyme monoacylglycerolipase, and they interact with various receptors, including as partial agonists as well as functional antagonists at the CP1 receptor, influencing processes such as inflammation, pain modulation, and metabolic regulation. Each of the two mags have a unique role in the endocannabinoid system, contributing to the overall balance and function of the ECBM. Now let's examine the pharmacology of the remaining ECBO mediators, including oleamide, N-arachidonyl dopamine, N-arachidonyl glycine, and resolvin D2. These compounds interact with various receptors such as CB1, GPR18, voltage-sensitive calcium channels, and dopamine heterodimers. SDEA activates PPAR alpha, whereas keto A interacts with TRYPV1. Now introducing the COX, LOX, and SIP enzymes and their roles in the ECBOM. These enzymes convert various dietary lipids into pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory molecules. Even though endocannabinoids themselves often are considered primarily anti-inflammatory, their oxidative metabolites are primarily pro-inflammatory. And the opposite is true for omega-3-derived oxidative metabolites, which have primarily anti-inflammatory properties. If we do not provide enough dietary omega-3 fatty acids in our diets, the bulk of our oxidative ECBO mediator metabolites will be pro-inflammatory. And we risk le leading to a systemic pro-inflammatory tone. Okay, are you ready to see what this system looks like when <laughs> one tries to visualize a significant part of it? This is how it looks. You can see how ridiculously interconnected and complex the ECBO really is. Understanding it all is an impossible mission. Keep in mind that this is only a small fraction of the ECBO mediator and receptor repertoire. The system is so expansive that it quickly becomes impossible to map it out in its entirety. Let's consider the category of N-acyl amino acids, for instance. It's one part fatty acid, of which there are at least 10, and one part amino acid, of which there are 20. That gives us 200 molecules in this category alone, likely putting the total number of ECBO mediators close to a thousand, maybe above. 
If you're more of a reader than a visual learner, you will enjoy spending some time with this table. Uh, in it, you will find many of the ECBO mediators we've just looked at, in addition to some of the most studied phytocannabinoids, included to make comparisons between the pharmacodynamics of phytocannabinoids and ECBO mediators EC. This table is included in the to be released ECBO article if you would like to go deeper in your learning. Let's continue with discussing the interconnected ECBOM and its relationship with different dietary patterns, starting with the Western diet. The Western diet is characterized by a very high consumption of omega-6 rich vegetable oils and a low consumption of omega-3 fatty acids. It's visually represented by the image of the hamburger and fries. This diet has led to a ridiculous increase in the dietary consumption of soybean oils in the case of the United States in the graph here. It's, it illustrates the dramatic rise, showing that from 1909 to 1999, the per person per year consumption of soybean oil increased by 1,163 times, reaching 11.64 kilograms. What we as a modern society have yet to grasp is that dietary fatty acids are much, much more than just sources of caloric energy, in stark contrast from carbohydrates. Omega-3 and omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids in particular are metabolized into bioactive lipid mediators where omega-3 fats is converted into anti-inflammatory mediators and omega-6 fats are converted into obesogenic endocannabinoids and pro-inflammatory lipid mediators. We can contrast the Western diet with the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet is characterized by a much lower intake of omega-6 fatty acids and a higher intake of omega-3 fatty acids. This diet includes foods such as olive oil, fish, and a variety of fruits and vegetables, depicted here. And the diagram shows how the Mediterranean diet positively influences the endocannabinoid system by providing more omega-3 precursor molecules rather than the omega-6 precursor the Western diet is so rich in. As depicted on this slide, dietary fibers represented by vegetables and mushrooms play a crucial role in promoting gut health. When consumed, these fibers are fermented by bacteria in our gut, producing short-chain fatty acids, such as acetate, propionate, and butyrate. These short-chain fatty acids have significant anti-inflammatory effects, which are partially mediated by endocannabinoids. Research shows that a diet rich in dietary fibers enhances the production of beneficial short-chain fatty acids, leading to improved gut microbiome composition and reduced inflammation. Research also shows that short-chain fatty acids increase endocannabinoid levels, and this is a key mechanism through which dietary fibers contribute to the health benefits associated with the Mediterranean diet. So in this paper, the researchers did not produce uh, the changes in short-chain fatty acids by supplementation or diet. The intervention was exercise. This exercise modulated the relative composition of the gut microbiome, which led to the changes in short-chain fatty acids and endocannabinoid levels. Exercise also releases anandamide during and after exertion, and this is what's behind the phenomenon known as runner's high. Research has also shown that certain ECBO mediators produced by specific gut microbes modulate dopaminergic responses to exercise through the gut-brain axis. Um, microbiota produced fatty acid amides are sensed by CB1 receptors on gut innovating neurons, which enhance their activity during exercise. Sensory neuron activation in turn augments dopamine signaling in the striatum driving motivation for exercise. Pretty wild stuff. And this slide highlights findings from a research study on the effects of mindfulness and meditation practices at a four-day yoga retreat. The study shows that these mindfulness practices significantly increase the levels of ECBOM mediators, including endocannabinoids and brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Another way of manipulating the health 
and status of the ECB ohm is by the use of phytocannabinoids such as THC and CBD. These molecules influence the ECB ohm on multiple levels. THC mimics many of the actions of anandamide, including activation of CB1, CB2, TRYPV1, and PPAers. CBD affects the metabolism of endocannabinoids in addition to its unique pharmacodynamic profile. I think most in the audience have decent ideas of CB1 and CB2 signaling, but perhaps not as good knowledge about the other drug targets presented in the chart. So let's take a look at some of them. CPR55 is important in energy metabolism, bone healing, and memory formation. TRYPV1 is also known as the chili receptor or capsaicin receptor. It's very important in noxious pain and heat signaling, as well as in inflammatory responses. GPR18 plays a role in immunity and the resolution of tissue inflammation. It's activated by resolvins and anarchidonoyl glycine, as well as THC. 581A is important for regulating mood and anxiety. It's involved in neuromodulation, including voluntary heart rate and blood pressure adaptation. And CB1, B1, D2 heterodimers are made up of one part CB1 receptor and one part dopamine, one or two receptor that have come together to form a functional complex. And this heterodimer is sensitive to both endocannabinoid ligands as well as dopamine ligands. These complexes are involved in regulation of synaptic transmission and dopamine release and connects the ECS with a dopaminergic reward system. And the final part of the figure highlights the metabolic enzymes COX, LOX, and SIP, which metabolize omega-6 and omega-3-derived ECB mediators. While endocannabinoids like anandamide and 2-AG are primarily anti-inflammatory, their oxidative metabolites produced by these enzymes tend to be pro-inflammatory. And in contrast, the oxidative metabolites of omega-3 fatty acids, such as EPA and DHA, generally exhibit anti-inflammatory properties. This underscores the importance of dietary balance in modulating inflammation through the ECBO. This is another table from the article that details different CB1 and CB2 GPCR heterodimers. I won't spend too much time here, but I will make a few mentionings. Examples include the dopamine heterodimers I just mentioned involved in the reward system. We have the more or mu opioid receptor heterodimers that interconnects the ECS with the endorphin-based analgesic system. We have orexin heterodimers involved in regulation of sleep and wakefulness. And we have the GHSR or ghrelin receptor heterodimer important for hunger and satiety. And also NMDA CB2 receptor heterodimers that brings the ECS yet another dimension of modulating glutamate signaling. This heterodimer is implicated in the pathology of Alzheimer's. Okay, we're now close to halfway through the lecture and we will continue our discussion around the ECBOM and metabolic health. So this slide highlights the significant changes in dietary fatty acid intake and composition over time, comparing hunter-gatherer diets to modern Western diets. Historically, hunter-gatherer diets were characterized by low energy density, high protein, and high fiber intake. They consumed a balanced ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids, typically around 1 to 1 to 2 to 1, with a high intake of omega-3s from wild game and fish. In much contrast, the modern Western diet has shifted dramatically. It's high in energy density, which increased consumption with increased consumption of processed foods rich in omega-6 fatty acids from vegetable oils and a significantly reduced intake of omega-3s. And this has led to an imbalanced omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, often exceeding 20 to 25 to 1. And this shift has profound implications for health. The high omega-6 intake promotes inflammation while the reduced omega-3 intake diminishes anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective effects. This imbalance negatively impacts the ECBOM, contributing to various chronic diseases. What is the real reason we should care about dietary omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids then? It's because polyunsaturated fatty acids are incorporated into the lipid bilayer of our cell membranes. The numbers on the screen refer to the amount of 
polyunsaturated fatty acids in the cell membranes of brain, heart, and liver cells. And as you can see, polyunsaturated fatty acids are integral building blocks of our cell membranes, no matter what tissue we're looking at. If we mostly eat omega-6 fatty acids, our cell membranes will incorporate mostly arachidonic acid into their structure. The graph on the right shows the dramatic increase in the consumption of various seed oils in the US over the past century. And it's hard not to take notice of the increase in dietary soybean consumption. And this shift has led to a significant rise in omega-6 fatty acid intake, disrupting the balance between omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids in our diet. And the metabolic pathways of omega-3 and omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids are shared, importantly. The most prevalent omega-6 fatty acid in the Western diet is linoleic acid. It has increased from about 1% in the early 20th century to about 8% at the end of the century. Excessive intake of omega-6 fatty acids will thus effectively inhibit the metabolism of omega-3 fats, leading to an overproduction of arachidonic acid, which in turn leads to an increased production of anandamide and 2-AG. And these endocannabinoids bind to CB1 receptor, driving upregulation of the receptor and contributing to obesity and metabolic dysfunction. In contrast, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are much less prevalent in the modern diet, play a crucial role in anti-inflammatory processes and maintaining metabolic health. The imbalance between omega-6 and omega-3 intake in the modern Western diet has significant implications for our overall health, promoting inflammation and metabolic disorders. This slide highlights the significant differences between grass-fed and grain-fed animal food products particularly in terms of their omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratios. So we're looking at fatty acid profiles of grass-fed versus grain-fed sirloin steak. And notice the five-fold increases in linoleic acid and arachidonic acid in the grain-fed meat. So our modern day meat production in those industries has completely changed the molecular content of animal food products that used to be omega-6, omega-3 rich foods and are now close to omega-6 rich foods. Let's take a look at some illuminating preclinical research, starting with this graph and table. So what you're looking at is the cumulative weight gain of four groups of mice, and they have been fed either a low-fat diet with 1% or 8% linoleic acid, or a medium-fat diet with 1% or 8% linoleic acid. And as I said, 8% linoleic acid is about what we're consuming today in the Western world. Now look at the table, specifically at leptin, we can see that leptin levels, which is a hunger hormone, is more than doubled in mice that's been on 8% linoleic acid compared to 1% linoleic acid. So the researchers then tried to find explanations into why the leptin levels were so altered in 8% linoleic acid diets. And what they discovered is that elevated liver endocannabinoids are likely to be blamed. So linoleic acid gets metabolized into arachidonic acid elevating liver arachidonyl ethanolamine and to arachidonyl glycerol. Makes sense, right? And this is another preclinical study that shows us the effects of omega-6 rich diets versus omega-3 rich diets on the ECBOM. The mice in the study were put on a high fat diet plus added omega-6 or omega-3 for 12 weeks. And we can see that the blood work and measurements from the mice on the omega-6 rich diet are absolutely terrible compared to the omega-3 supplemented mice. The omega-6 to 3 ratio for omega-6 supplemented mice was about 20 to 1, whereas the omega-3 supplemented mice had a ratio of around 1 to 1. And these dietary differences have clearly caused fatty liver disease in the omega-6 supplemented mice, but not in the omega-3 supplemented mice. So in the study, the researchers also looked at levels of omega-3 and omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid phospholipids, levels of two monoacyl glycerols, and levels of N-acyl ethanolamines. And as you can see, the differences are quite astounding for many ECBO mediators. And the big difference in liver anandamide levels is particularly worrying. What about ECBOM mediator levels? Can we similarly affect them by changing our dietary habits? 
absolutely. Our dietary choices have significant impact, as you can see. The graphs show blood work from patients before and after a brief two-day Mediterranean diet intervention. And most ECBO mediators are quickly upregulated when adopting healthy, healthy eating habits. The biggest difference are in omega-3 derived ECBO mediators, as can be expected. Returning briefly again to the preclinical study in which the omega-6 supplementation caused severe changes to the health of the ECBO and the liver. It turns out that mice on low-fat omega-6, high-fat omega-6, or high-fat omega-3 diets develop vastly different microbiomes. And we're not looking at small differences here, folks. Anyone can see that these three diets impact the composition of our gut microbiomes to a significant degree. While on the topic, is there anything we can do about the health of our microbiomes? Absolutely. This illustration shows a heat map of the relative proportions of various bacterial genera in the gut microbiome before and after a four-day dietary intervention. The top portion of the heat map displays bacterial genera associated with the production of short-chain fatty acids, uh, which are beneficial for gut health. And the bottom portion shows bacterial genera that might be that may be more pathogenic or undesirable. And this study involved a crossover design where participants followed either a fast food diet or a Mediterranean diet for four days. And the heat map indicates that the Mediterranean diet led to an increase in the relative abundance of short chain fatty acid producing bacteria, while the fast food diet was associated with an increase in potentially pathogenic bacterial taxa. This slide highlights the relationship between omega-6 and 3 polyunsaturated fatty acid intake and metabolic health, focusing on the differences between metabolically healthy and unhealthy individuals. And looking at the graph, we can see that the omega-6 to 3 ratios are different in metabolically healthy compared to unhealthy people, irrespective of whether they are obese or not. The metabolically unhealthy groups have a higher omega-6 to 3 ratio of 12 to 13, indicating a higher intake of omega-6 relative to omega-3. And in contrast, the metabolically healthy groups have a more balanced ratio of around 5. The data suggests that a higher intake of omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids relative to omega-3s is directly associated with metabolic dysfunction. This research investigates alterations in the ECBOME signaling in the context of obesity and type 2 diabetes. So the data presented here compares various components of the ECBOME system across different groups, insulin sensitive, insulin resistant, and type 2 diabetic individuals. And there are significant differences in circulating and intestinal levels of monoacylglycerols and n acylethanolamines between the groups. Obese and type 2 diabetic individuals show altered levels of many mediators compared to healthy controls. Importantly, 2-AG is upregulated. The me expression of genes involved in ECBO metabolism and signaling was also significantly different in the small intestine of obese and type 2 diabetic individuals, indicating dysregulation in ECBO signaling. Changes in the expression of ECBOM receptors, particularly GPR55, were also noted, suggesting altered ECBOM signaling in these conditions. It also indicates the potential importance of GPR, GPR55 receptor as a therapeutic target in metabolic disorders. So what we're looking here is an intervention, a randomized clinical trial in which 38 patients were given fish oil and 35 patients were given corn oil for 12 weeks. And as you can see, fasting insulin, HOMA IR value, triglycerides and LDL values were all significantly improved uh, in the fish oil arm. This slide presents fascinating research on how a dietary imbalance of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids can induce hedonic eating behaviors in mice. So the graphs show that the intake of water and sucrose solutions by mice in different dietary groups. In panel C, uh, it illustrates that mice in the omega-6 high 
omega-3 low group consumed significantly more 1% sucrose solution compared to the control group. Similarly, panel D shows that the mice also consume more 10% sucrose solution when given access to both water and sucrose. And the findings suggest that an imbalance in dietary omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids drives hedonic eating behaviors characterized by a preference for sweet, palatable foods. And this behavior is likely linked to changes in the endocannabinoid system, which plays a crucial role in regulating appetite and reward. The researchers continued with elucidating the underlying mechanisms behind the observed hedonic eating in the mice. And they focused on altered dopamine signaling. The graphs show the time course of dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, which is a key brain region involved in reward and motivation. Mice on a high omega-6, low omega-3 diet exhibit increased dopamine release in response to both water and 10% sucrose solutions compared to control mice. And this heightened dopamine signaling suggests an enhanced reward response. On the bottom panels, I through K shows the effects of flapenthixol, a dopamine receptor antagonist, on water and sucrose intake. Treatment with flapenthixol reduces sucrose intake in the omega-6 high, omega-3 low group, confirming that the hedonic eating behavior is indeed driven by altered dopamine signaling. But the researchers did not stop there. Uh, in the next research phase, the offspring of mothers on a controlled diet or omega-6 rich diet during gestation were analyzed. Uh, the graph on the left illustrates the cumulative intake of 10% sucrose solution over 24 hours. An offspring exposed to the omega-6 diet during gestation consumed significantly more sucrose compared to controls, indicating increased hedonic eating behaviors. And the photos in the middle show the number of tyrosine hydroxylase positive dopaminergic neurons in the ventral tegmental area of the brain. An offspring exposed to the omega-6 high, omega-3 low diet during gestation had a significantly higher number of dopaminergic neurons in the VTA compared to controls as seen by the bar graphs. And these findings suggest that maternal dietary imbalance of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids can program the offspring's brain to have more dopaminergic neurons in the VTA. And this alteration likely underlies the increased hedonic eating behaviors observed in the offspring. So let's stop a while and summarize what we've talked about with regards to the ECBOM and metabolism. The Western diet is characterized by a very high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And our physiology is shaped by dietary patterns close to a balanced one-to-one -one ratio. Omega-6 fatty acids are metabolized to arachidonic acid, which is incorporated in the plasma membranes of our cells. And the increased arachidonic acid phospholipid prevalence and decreased omega-3 phospholipid prevalence leads to increased basal endocannabinoid signaling and a systemic pro-inflammatory tone. Very high consumption of omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids effectively inhibits omega-3 metabolism and decreases anti-inflammatory lipid mediators. Omega-6-induced ECS dysfunction might be a root cause of metabolic dysfunction and pro-inflammatory disorders. Omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid supplementation can help to normalize and cannabinoid levels. Insulin-sensitive, insulin-resistant, and type 2 diabetic people have significant alterations to their ECBOM systems. And finally, mice on omega-6 rich diets develop increased dopaminergic activity to palatable foods, as do the offspring of mothers-to-be that eat an omega-6 rich diet during gestation. This is a rather common belief about cannabis and cannabis users. We know cannabis consumption acutely drives our appetites for junk food. Does this mean that we are predisposing our patients to future metabolic problems by prescribing their medical cannabis? Well, the answer is a resounding no. Many research studies have implicated or replicated these results to the left. Regular cannabis users have lower BMI and increased metabolic health compared to non-users. 
Furthermore, at least in this study of recreational cannabis users and non-users, cannabis users still consumed 834 additional calories compared to non-users, supposedly without driving weight gain or metabolic problems. And the reason that cannabis users have increased tolerance to metabolic disorder is quite simple. Their chronic use of THC has led to a significant downregulation of central CV1 receptors, attenuating the effects of CV1 activation over time. We will now spend a little time looking at eCVOM dysfunction in neurodegenerative diseases. Specifically, we will be looking at Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is characterized by the deposition of amyloid beta plaques in the brain. This leads to a progressive loss of synapses, resulting in the de deterioration of brain functions such as memory, personality, and motor skills. The disease is believed to start manifesting approximately 25 to 30 years before the first clinical symptoms appear. And one of the earliest biomarkers detectable in pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's patients is altered glucose metabolism in the brain, particularly in the hippocampus. And the images below are three-dimensional stereotactic surface projection scans of a patient with Alzheimer's disease. And the blue regions indicate areas where glucose metabolism measured by FDG activity is significantly lower, at least three standard deviations below that of healthy controls of the same age. And this pattern of decreased FDG activity, especially in the temporal and parietal lobes, is to Alzheimer's disease. And early detection of these changes is, of course, crucial for timely intervention. Let's delve into the molecular changes occurring in the hippocampus during the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. The graphs on this slide illustrate the expression levels of two key endocannabinoid receptors, GPR55 and CB2, in the hippocampus of mice. On the left, we see the relative expression of GPR55 mRNA. And notice that in the Alzheimer's disease model mice, labeled as APPNLGF, the expression of GPR55 is significantly upregulated compared to wild type controls. And this increase is evident at six months of age, which is when co cognitive symptoms are starting to emerge in this model. Similarly, the graph on the right shows the expression of CB2 mRNA. And again, we observe a marked upregulation in the Alzheimer's model mice at six and 12 months. These findings suggest that both GPR55 and CB2 receptors are upregulated very early in the disease process, indicating their potential involvement in the pathological mechanisms of Alzheimer's. And understanding the roles of these receptors could open new avenues for therapeutic interventions aimed at mitigating the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Now let's discuss the role of GPR55 in Alzheimer's. First, activation of GPR55 enhances insulin sensitivity and secretion, which can help mitigate the metabolic dysfunctions seen in Alzheimer's patients. And the fact that GPR55 is upregulated very early in the disease and that its activation is beneficial suggests the existence of a therapeutic window where GPR55 agonism early on in the disease might help to slow down the disease from progressing. GPR55 has neuroprotective effects. It's high expression in hypothalamus, which is involved in energy balance and glucose metabolism in the brain. Modulating GPR55 activity could provide neuroprotective benefits, potentially slowing the progression of Alzheimer's. Additionally, GPR55 activation might improve cognitive functions by enhancing insulin signaling and reducing metabolic stress. It could help improve memory and learning as insulin resistance is very tightly linked to cognitive decline. And lastly, GPR55 has anti-inflammatory properties. And since neuroinflammation is a hallmark of Alzheimer's, targeting GPR55 could help reduce inflammation and protect neuronal health. Next, let's examine the role of CB2 receptors in Alzheimer's. And they helped clear amyloid beta, reducing plaque formation. And interestingly, their numbers increase with the plaque presence, suggesting a natural protective response as well as a potential target for therapy. CB2 receptors in the brain's immune cells play a crucial role in neuroprotection. When activated, they combat neuroinflammation and stress, shielding neurons and potentially slowing Alzheimer's progression. 
And lastly, CB2 receptor activation has been associated with cognitive improvements, reduced amyloid plaques, and reduced neurofibrillary tangles in animal models of Alzheimer's disease. So this preclinical research shows the beneficial effects of the terpene and phytocannabinoid beta caryophyllin or BCP, on Alzheimer's disease pathology. The experiment that is performed is called the Morris water maze test and is depicted to the left. Mice are placed in the water and will search for a hidden platform on which they can rest. And when presented with this test for several days in a row, mice with no memory impairment will take shorter and shorter time to locate the platform, whereas animals with impaired memory will have forgotten where the platform is. So in panel A, we see the escape latency in the Morris water maze test, and the APP PS1 mice treated with BSP showed a significant reduction in escape latency over five days, indicating an improvement in memory function compared to the vehicle treated group. Panel B similarly illustrate the swimming distance, and again, BCP treated mice demonstrated a marked decrease in the distance swam to find the hidden platform, further supporting the enhancement in cognitive performance. And in panel C, we observe the average swimming speed, and the BCP treated mice maintained a consistent swimming speed, suggesting that the improvements in memory were not due to changes in physical ability. And finally, panel D, it shows the time spent in quadrant four during the probe tests, which is a measure of spatial memory. And the BCP treated mice spent significantly more time in the target quadrant, indicating better uh, spatial memory retention. So in summary, these results suggest that BCP rescues memory impairment and enhances spatial memory in a disease model for Alzheimer's disease. And the researchers also examined the effect of BCP on amyloid beta plaque formation in the APP PS1 mouse model. And this slide presents compelling evidence that BCP treatment significantly reduces amyloid beta plaque burden in both the hippocampus and cerebral cortex of these mice. Panel B quantifies this reduction in the hippocampus, demonstrating a significant decrease in beta amyloid plaques in BCP treated mice. And similarly, panel C shows a significant reduction in beta amyloid in the cerebral cortex of BCP treated mice. So the findings suggest that BCP not only improves cognitive function, but also reduces amyloid plaque burden, likely through CB2 receptor activation and anti-inflammatory pathways. This underscores the therapeutic potential of targeting the ECBOM system in Alzheimer's. Does omega-3 fatty acids protect cognitive health and mortality from Alzheimer's disease in senior citizens? This was the question the researchers set out to answer in this recent study from 2024. The average American eats fish shellfish 1.2 times a week, and the highest quartile consuming fish three times a week had significantly higher cognitive assessment scores compared to the low lowest quartile. And the highest quartile had a 30% lower risk of subjective cognitive decline and a 44% lower risk of AD mortality compared to the lowest quartile of patients. And keeping our minds at fish consumption, but instead switching our focus from AD to mood disorders and major depression. These results are from a Lancet paper in 1998, which made strong headlines at the time when it was published. The negative relationship between fish consumption and depression is remarkably strong, where countries like Japan, who eat 140 pounds of fish per person a year, hardly ever experience major depression. On the other side, we have countries such as New Zealand and Germany and Canada that experience a lot of major depression and they consume very small amounts of fish. So even though most of the evidence for efficacy of omega-3 fatty acids is based on population data rather than individual data, we can clearly see that ingestion of omega-3 fatty acids is likely to mediate protective effects, not only for metabolic disorders, but perhaps also for protection against mood disorders and dementia. This final slide introduces the concept of integrative approaches to modulating the endocannabinoid system. We won't have time to discuss it in length or depth, but we will 
take a look at it. The central idea is here that an integrative approach combining various lifestyle factors and interventions may be beneficial for modulating the ECBOM and supporting its functions. And while medical cannabis and cannabinoid-based products are often looked upon as the only existing ECS interventions, in reality, they're only but a part of a broader holistic approach that also includes diet, exercise, mindfulness, social connections, and targeted supplements. And this integrative approach recognizes the multifaceted nature of the endocannabinoid system and the potential synergistic effects of combining different interventions. It's very popular to talk about the entourage effect in the world of medical cannabis, which argues that full-spectrum cannabis products work better than isolates. And this might well be true, but when talking about potential synergy with cannabinoids, the addition of lifestyle interventions like these are much more likely to mediate better and stronger responses. The beauty of the ECBOM is that we have many different alternative therapeutic interventions that all act on the ECBOM. And by taking a multimodal approach to ECBO modulation, doctors can expect greater results in their patients, especially if the theory is that they suffer from imbalances in the ECBO. So with that, I say thank you for listening and I hope that you've learned a few things along the way. Thank you so much, Stefan. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we haven't had any questions, so I'm going to give people a couple of minutes just to see if um, they want, if there's anyone with a burning question. Otherwise, um, we will share a recording of this with everybody who's attended and everybody who's registered. We'll also make it available to all of our members because this is absolutely fantastic content and, you know, so, so interesting. So we've had a question um, pop up. So someone's just told you how wonderful it was. So um, unfortunately, we're not going to take questions verbally. So if you do want to just write a question on the Q&A, uh, we can come to you. Um, we've just had a couple of people raise their hands. Uh, give it a moment. So there's a question here, Stefan. I'm not sure if you can see it from Don. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see your references to CBD and THC. Have you investigated the CBD and THCA? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, CBDA and THCA, they're very, very interesting molecules therapeutically. Unfortunately, they're also very unstable molecules, which is why they're very hard to use in, in medicines today. But um, they are absolutely fascinating molecules, and they have, I think, even more uh, therapeutic potential than THC and CBD. I'm sure that scientists will work on converting them into more stable um, variants that will be used in medicine in the future. Lovely. Thank you, Stefan. So we just had some more compliments for you coming in, but no more questions. So um, if you're happy to do so, um, I'll bring this, we'll bring this to an end.